my heart and my thoughts and my prayers are in Arizona this afternoon, where the McCain family earlier today announced that Senator John McCain has chosen to stop all medical treatment for brain cancer, a diagnosis the family bravely shared with the world a year ago. At this hour, close friends and longtime aides are traveling to Arizona. The family releasing a statement this morning that reads in part, quote, John has surpassed expectations for his survival, but the progress of disease and the inexorable advance of age render their verdict. With his usual strength of will, he has now chosen to discontinue medical treatment. John McCain is a giant in American politics, having run twice for president under the banners of the Straight Talk Express and Country First. Senator McCain's voice is cherished across the partisan divide now more than ever. After Donald Trump's Helsinki summit, McCain released a statement that read, quote, today's press conference in Helsinki was one of the most disgraceful performances by an American president in memory. The damage inflicted by President Trump's naivete, egotism, false equivalence, and sympathy for autocrats is difficult to calculate. But it's clear that the summit in Helsinki was a tragic mistake. John McCain doesn't mince words. He has a quick wit, a deep affection for baseball, Hemingway, his friends, and barbecues in Sedona. He loves his country and his family more than all else, and his voice has elevated the debates in Washington at times they most needed to be raised. I fell in love with my country when I was a prisoner in someone else's. I loved it, not just for the many comforts of life here. I loved it for its decency, for its faith, and the wisdom justice and goodness of its people. I loved it because it was not just a place, but an idea, a cause worth fighting for. I was never the same again. I wasn't my own man anymore. I was my country's. I got to ask you a question. I do not uh, believe in, I can't trust Obama. I, I, I have read about him and he's not, he's not, he's a, um, he's an Arab. He is not. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. No, no ma'am. No, ma no, ma he's a, he's a, he's a decent family man, citizen that I just happen to have disagreements with on, on fundamental issues. And that's what this campaign is all about. He's not. In a contest as long and difficult as this campaign has been, his success alone commands my respect for his ability and perseverance but that he managed to do so by inspiring the hopes of so many millions of Americans who had once wrongly believed that they had little at stake or little influence in the election of an American president is something I deeply admire and commend him for achieving. How do you want the American people to remember you? Uh, he served his country and not always right. Made a lot of mistakes, made a lot of errors but served his country, and I hope we could add honorably. <laughs> Here to talk about Senator McCain on the day that he has made another brave decision today to cease treatment, some people who know him very well. NBC News' is Andrea Mitchell, who, among many things for us, covered Capitol Hill uh, during much of the time that, that Senator McCain was serving there. Mark Leibovich, chief national correspondent for New York Times Magazine, who's written several profiles of Senator McCain and almost as importantly knows the people around him better than anyone, and presidential historian John Meacham, who also knows the senator very well. Um, let me start with you, Andrea Mitchell. And um, today is a day, those three clips I played, I, I happened to be there for all three of those moments. But um, John McCain's been one of the most important voices during the Trump presidency. And I read that clip after the Helsinki summit because there was exactly. nothing that animated this president or, or, or this senator, Senator McCain, more than sort of the urgency of being who we're supposed to be, the urgency of this country being at its best. And I think that um, as he sort of enters the final stages of his fight against cancer, it's that voice during the Trump era that in some ways has been the most valiant and the most clear. Absolutely. And as great as he's been all of these years, and he acknowledges his ups and downs, and you've watched it along the way, this year has been so memorable because of his uniquely strong voice, a searing voice against many of the policies and decisions of a very divisive president. And in particular, after Helsinki, it was so striking that John McCain, from his sickbed in his beloved ranch in Sedona, 
having the strength and the wisdom to speak out strongly in a way that most Republicans, certainly those in the Senate, have not. And that is what is so striking about him. Also, the speech last July 25th on the Senate floor where he spoke of his own failures, but importantly of the failures of his Democratic and Republican colleagues. He chastised them so strongly for being so partisan, for not working across the aisle as he has in the past with with those he did not always respect, John Kerry, Teddy Kennedy, and others. Uh, Hillary Clinton, who would travel with him to Iraq and Afghanistan as a member of the Armed Services Committee. The fact that he always found a way to work with Democrats and with Republicans with whom he did not agree for the greater good of the country. That is what I think of most when I think of John McCain. John Meacham, um, some of, I, I had the privilege of uh, traveling with him in 2008 on the campaign trail where the two stories that he and they called themselves the three amigos, Lindsey Graham, Joe Lieberman, and John McCain, told in the most um, rapid succession, they were sort of on regular rotation, were stories about traveling um, to Iraq with then Senator Hillary uh, Clinton talking about working collaboratively. I think when you're in Iraq, there aren't Democrats and Republicans. Republicans, there's an American senatorial mm. delegation. Um, the, the other stories that, that we heard or that they told the most were, were stories about being on the phone with American allies, NATO allies who faced the gravest threats from Russia. Saakashvili called every day and there was a day on the campaign yep. trail where John McCain and Joe Lieberman and I think Lindsey Graham was there and they said, today we're all Georgians and headquarters called and said, that better be the state, not the country because we are <laughs> running for our lives. But these guys were so focused on Russia as an enemy and NATO allies as our stalwart friends. And if you look at how dramatically um, different today's Trump Republican Party is, it, 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 you have to think this is one of, of the saddest sort of political developments in John McCain's life. Well, it's going to be a very poignant period here. It already is and, and will be as, as, as the senator goes into the long twilight. Um, and one of the things I remember from that, that same period was sitting with him. I just looked it up this afternoon. It was almost exactly 12 Augusts ago. It was August of 2007. And I remember sitting with the senator and Mark Salter, uh, his great speechwriter and co-author, in a darkened hotel in Times Square. Uh, and they were by themselves. Uh, nobody else was around. He was in New York. Uh, he couldn't get arrested in the polls uh, for the Republican <laughs> nomination that year. And uh, we were sitting in this shadowy room. I have this vision. It was kind of like a, a C-SPAN version of The Godfather. And he had bet his entire political fortune on whether or not the surge that George W. Bush had put into effect would work. And he said, hey, we're going to have a we're going to see if there are results. I believe there will be. And then we're going to get back into this in the fall, meaning the campaign, and it will test our mettle. And what struck me then and ever since was it's very rare, as you well know, for a presidential candidate, it's now vanishingly rare, to base an entire campaign, their personal fortunes, their personal fate, on an actual policy that actually affects real people. And it was affecting the people of Iraq and the, and the soldiers who were projecting force there, trying to bring order to chaos. And the, only, the other thought, of course, is uh, I had more conversations with him about Robert Jordan uh, from, from Who the Bell Tolls than I ever did in English class. And the closing image of that novel is Jordan's heart beating on the forest floor as he, tries, as he prepares to take one more shot. And I've always thought of John McCain's heart always beating and always will. Um, I've never told this story before, but today's as good a day as any. Uh, Mark Leibovich, one of my most memorable days on the campaign in 08 was John McCain reading The Snows of Kilimanjaro out loud to me, um, Mark Salter, um, and a couple of their aides who were with him. I believe we were in Wisconsin in a hotel room. And let me just say, John McCain, I have never stayed at a Four Seasons or Ritz-Carlton in service of the McCain campaign. It was always um, a La Quinta or a you know, Quality Inn. I mean, he did not eat fancy food. He got canned tuna from Costco and put it on the plane and said, look, Cindy and I have a new load of groceries. And we stayed at very downscale, um, lovely hotels. But, but, but he was not a fan of luxury. Um, but he did um, love Hemingway. I, I, I want... Um, um, your thoughts about that. I also want to put this out there because uh, John Meacham raised Mark Salter. I traded emails with Mark Salter today. You've profiled Mark Salter. Um, and he was the man who put 
um, I don't know how to say it, who put poetry to um, John McCain's patriotic soul. Talk about both things. Yeah, well, first of all, I mean, Mark Salter and John McCain, I mean, have that's as true a political alter ego, um, you know, relationship as you're going to find. I mean, he truly is a muse. I think they obviously have nurtured each other in all kinds of ways. Um, and yeah, Mark is, um, yeah, Mark has been just right there and he's right there today. So he's someone that, that will always be linked to the mythology of John McCain. I mean, I do think just when you talk about just these little anecdotes about what it's like to hang around with him, and there are very few politicians these days, by the way, who let you just hang around. And there's probably good reason for that because uh, John McCain was never great for the age of Twitter. I mean, these, some of these pre-Twitter campaigns like 2007, 2008, 2000 um, were much better suited for McCain. 2000 mm -hmm. better than 2008, by the way. But he, um, it, it's just trying to remember things and trying to tell little stories. You, you just remember, first of all, you try to edit for TV what you can tell and what you can't tell. <laughs> but um, it, it's often just the things that are buried in your notebook or buried at the end of the story that you'd forgotten. I mean, I was rereading some things today, and I remember... I was writing about him for the Washington Post in 2004, I think, and we had gone to an Arizona Diamondbacks game, and we were sitting in the front row, and the opposing pitcher for, like, San Diego, I think, it, it, he was a relief pitcher, and it set up on the scoreboard, this guy is the first ever graduate of Mass Massachusetts Institute of Technology ever to make an appearance in a Major League Baseball game. So this guy comes up, he, he probably gives up about five runs without giving up an out, Manager goes to get him. He's like sort of slumping off the mound, and McCain gets up and says, "Yeah, next stop NASA, pal. We'll see you at NASA." <laughs> and it was like, "Okay, we have a U.S. senator who is now heckling next to me." And I don't think he was doing it for my benefit either. But um, no, there's just a lot of mini little things that just sort of get lost, but you just don't forget on days like today. Andrew Mitchell, um, obviously his wife, his family, um, the loves of his life, but, but he had a lot of love affairs with deep, deep, deep friends. And um, the friendships I mentioned, Joe um, Lieberman, I mentioned Lindsey Graham. Um, uh, to be honest, I understand that friendship to have gone through some, some turmoil in, in the time of, of Trump. But, but the relationship with um, Joe Lieberman um, was one of the most remarkable friendships I've ever witnessed. The relationship with Mark Salter, one of the most... Um, you know, for, for, for sort of, uh, you know, burly men, which I, I put them both in that category. This, this truly has been a love affair. One man putting um, words that are just as, as exquisite as, as any poetry um, to sort of the heart and soul of a man who truly embodies the slogans under which he ran. And I remember having a fight um, with Mark Salter once who, who was arguing with something we were going to do for the campaign. And Salter said, damn it, Nicole, that isn't putting country first. And I said, Mark, it's a slogan. You know, but these guys just, they, they felt things. They were so earned. They, they were so true to the things they said and ran on. So rare. And I mean, and I think Mark Leverage has it right when he refers to the muse that Salter is to McCain and the closeness of that relationship. Uh, and there were other relationships that were not self-evident uh, because McCain did not love some of jo Joe Biden's ideas about Iraq when Joe Biden was chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. But they forged a bond over their devotion to foreign policy and to the soldiers and with Bo Biden's diagnosis and that moment when Bo Biden on The View with Megan was comforting her in December, it was around December 13th of last year, shortly after John McCain's last Senate vote and he had retreated to Sedona and he was really showing the ravages of the treatment for the cancer as much as anything else. He was in a wheelchair and uh, she broke down and Biden got up and, and hugged her and uh, said that, you know, John McCain had helped him through so many stages with young Bo, and he met when Bo was a child and when John McCain lost his first wife and when he had these two kids and was just coming into the Senate and people like John McCain and Teddy Kennedy and others uh, were, were comforting him along the way. And Bo had, you know, suffered earlier illnesses that we didn't even know about at the time. So John McCain was such a family man and such a, uh, an embracer of colleagues in ways that people didn't know. And one other thing that I really wanted to point out, he and John Kerry were not close on a lot of policy issues, mm -hmm. but it was he and John Kerry who were opponents on opposite sides of the post-Vietnam War debate in this mm -hmm. country that gave Bill Clinton, an accused draft dodger, the political cover to make peace with Vietnam. 
when he was president mm -hmm. at the Vietnam Memorial. I was there that day on Memorial Day and then going with the, the, the team to make peace and sign that agreement with Vietnam. And that was an incredible contribution uh, to to world peace, really. Um, uh, John Meacham, Andrew Mitchell is talking about Joe Biden, Ted Kennedy, um, John McCain as big hearted men, which they all are. Um, how will history remember um, big hearted John McCain's selection of Sarah Palin as his running mate? Not favorably, I don't think. Uh, it's one of the moments that um, uh, I suspect Senator McCain uh, means when he talks about uh, being an imperfect public servant. Um, he, uh, you know, you forgot more about this than I know, but, uh, you know, he, he rolled the dice uh, at a critical moment in the summer of 2008, uh, elevating someone who did give him a boost in the polls initially. Um, we'll argue forever about whether the Palin pick uh, mainstream some of the Tea Party opposition that we weren't calling it that then, but to, to President Obama. But I, one of the things that I so admire about Senator McCain and Bob Dole and George H.W. Bush, sort of the, that, that this last group of, of, of truly great uh, people whose heroics were mostly in the 20th century, uh, at least as young men, is that they called them as they saw them. If they screwed up, they said, hey, I screwed up. Judge me on the totality of my life. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're after a more perfect union here, not a perfect one. Uh, Mark Lee Richard, the author of a book called This Town, That Town That You Live In, um, doesn't have another John McCain. That's never been more clear than watching um, people who held themselves shoulder to shoulder with him, people like Lindsey Graham and, and, and others, um, watching them wilt and really disappear, melt like butter in the time of Donald Trump. What is that town like with uh, John McCain sort of uh, battling his disease in, in Sedona? And, and what will that town be like when, when, there, when, when his voice isn't, isn't part of these debates? I mean, no one else put out a statement like the one I read after Helsinki. No one else boiled it down to brass tacks, called it a tragic disgrace. There is no voice like John McCain's in that town. Right. I mean, I think, first of all, I mean, I think the point needs to be made that for as mavericky and as, as original as John McCain has been, and obviously he, he proved his mettle on battlefields and prison that, that, you know, you can only just revere, he was very much a creature of Washington. I mean, he loved green rooms. He was probably, <laughs> I don't know if he loved green rooms, but he, was, he, he knew the back of every green room in Washington. There's no <laughs> question about it. He probably, I think he set the record for most appearances on Meet the Press. Yep. So at least that was true for a while. Um, and so, yeah, he was around. He was very much a creature of this town. And um, he also, he played a part. He, he was aware of the many acts that he has had over the years, the many cliches that he sometimes embodied, and the shorthand that people talk about each other with in politics. Um, clearly, over the last year, his voice has been very powerful. Um, I think it's emblematic of, of the people who have been most outspoken about Donald Trump from within the Republican Party have been those with nothing to lose, uh, whether it's, you know, uh, Jeff Lake or, or Bob Corker and put McCain in that category, but I would also put McCain in a very different category because you've got to figure he would probably be pretty outspoken anyway. And, and look, it's just it's a much more profound backstory and a much more profound sort of lamp of experience that he speaks with. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.